Hi everyone, welcome back to another Facebook Live interview with the National Spine Health Foundation. I'm your host today, Erica Anderson, and I'm so excited today to speak with our guest, uh, Dr. Leah Carrion. She's the Clinical Research Director at Norton Leatherman Spine and a professor at the Spine Surgery for Spine Center for Surgery and Research at the University of Southern Denmark. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Yeah, so um, a lot of people watching know that we, in the month of February, are focusing on research and how important it is and why it matters, and we know that you're heavily involved in that, and so we thought you'd be a great person to talk to. To get us started, if you could just tell us a little bit about what you do at Norton Leatherman um, and why you have gotten so interested in the research side of things. So, um, yeah, for a relatively small, you know, non-academic practice, we do have a really strong research infrastructure. So I was a spine fellow here in 96 and 97. Uh, so I was trained in spine surgery. Prior to that, I was a fellow in England as well as in, in Japan. So from that experience, you could, I already saw that there's this vast uh, differences in terms of patients, patient care, approaches to uh, surgery and treatment uh, as you go through all of those different cultures. So that's, and seeing how patients actually, I, I mean, I feel like part of patient care is also educating the patient. And in order for us to provide that education, I think a lot of research needs to be done in order to create that knowledge base and impart that knowledge base, but also to uh, find out how patients actually interact and absorb that, that education. So it's more of a holistic approach to both looking at, you know, the surgery side of things the, and the patient side of things, as well as the, you know, other ancillary uh, healthcare procedures or interventions that go around, not just the surgery itself, but, you know, taking care of the patient as a whole. Okay. Now, I know you've been working on the research and patient expectation survey. Um, can you talk a little bit more about that and give us a few details about what it is? So the thing with a lot of orthopedic procedures, and especially spine, is that we're not really a life-threatening um, disease. We're more of a quality of life threatening disease. So it's kind of harder to put, you know, a, a metric to it. You know, for cardiac disease, we have, you know, ECG, lipid levels. For lung disease, we have pulmonary function tests and, and stuff like that. For orthopedics and spine, we have no, we just look at, did this improve my quality of life or not? So that also goes back to what do patients expect after their surgery? So that's an individual um, concept, right? And other patient, other researchers have looked at it. Carol Mancuso in New York, you know, there's the patient generated index and patient expectations are different um, depending on your age, you know, what your value system is, you know, some patients they're at, and especially with the aging population, you know, who are more active, they're expecting a lot more. And they we want to, so they're expecting a lot more. It's like, uh, will I be able to go back to the activities that I used to do? And that can be just playing with their kids, doing arts and crafts with their kids, all the way up to playing tennis again, you know, playing soccer, you know. So those are the expectations we're, we're looking at. But at the same time, we're looking at after surgery, how much they can expect in terms of recovery and all of that other stuff. Okay. Now you've worked in the world of spine for quite some time. I, I know this is sort of a big question, but what are some of the most notable advancements that you've noticed, say, in the past 10 years that we could really, you know, say like, wow, this is pretty incredible? I mean, it's ev it's everything from the really small stuff, right, to the to the big stuff. And I mean, it's not just, and you have to think about it again, again it, about it holistically, the things that we're able to do now because of other advances. Some of them are commercial advances. For example, um, being able to, look, it used to, so now we're doing what's called ERAS, which is enhanced recovery after surgery. 
where it used to be we'd put patients on nothing to eat after midnight or eight hours before. But now we are asking them to stay hydrated all the way up to two to three hours before surgery instead of having them in what we call a catabolic state where they're hungry. I mean, just imagine uh, being asked to run a marathon when you haven't eat, eaten for eight hours. So in contrast, now that we have those clear protein drinks, you know, those, those sports drinks, now we can ask them to go ahead and be, you can load them with protein you know, even six, seven, eight hours before surgery and ask them to be well hydrated using sports drinks, you know, two to three hours before surgery. So that's that that couldn't have happened like five, 10 years ago when all we had were like those milk-based uh, protein shakes, right? Yeah. Uh, and also, I mean, small things like asking people, asking patients to chew gum right after they come out of surgery, you know, to, to get their bowels moving moving quickly so those small things but there's also the big things like um being able to look at you know opioid sparing anesthesia right now trying to move patients away from opioids even from uh putting them to sleep trying to get them away from that and trying to be more cognizant of the the bad effects of of opioids um and just like thinking about streamlining processes as well you know trying to get you know, we didn't think about the importance of glucose control until like a few years ago. And now instead of just, you know, taking it for granted that patients will be able to control their blood glucose, you know, during surgery and they'll recover well. Now we're looking at trying to optimize them way early, even prior to their surgery. So again, it's more of a holistic approach. It's not just like looking at surgical technique, although that has also improved a lot in terms of minimally invasive techniques, robotics, and all that. It's not just the the aspect of surgery that we're looking at. It's it's the whole taking care of the patient. Mm, yeah, there's so much good stuff. Yeah. Now, a lot of our people um, here in our audience are newer to the spine world. They may be facing surgery for the first time, and we hear a lot of people that are kind of scared about surgery. Um, and you've worked in this world for a long time. What would be encouragement you would give someone that is nervous about do going in for surgery, but they're sort of at that point where it's their only option? Well, that's the thing is that it's really a lifestyle choice, right? Uh, again, it's a quality of life uh, threatening issue, not a life threatening issue. And it's always your choice to have surgery or not. And again, it's always a I mean, there's this push for us to do what we call shared decision making, where the patient is involved in the decision to have or not have surgery. So there's, again, there's a lot of that educational piece that I talked about earlier, have that knowledge base of, let's say, um, okay, given that you have these patients, these characteristics, you're a smoker, you have diabetes, you're, you're overweight, we need to bring this down, you improve these metrics in order for us to do surgery for you. But when you think about it, once you control all those metrics, your back pain might actually. <laughs> yeah. You know? So yeah. in England, it's always, yeah, lose two stones, stop smoking and exercise. And hopefully even just doing those three things will always, will already get you to the path of not having surgery done. Um, and most surgeons, most spine surgeons in our practice, and uh, I would guess in your practice as well, we okay. try very, very hard. We try very, very hard not to do surgery. Like, yeah, we'll do a conservative care of like at least six months to just see, you know, to 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 give you that that space and time to have, you know, to make that decision if surgery is right for you or not. Or if you have the the capacity to to try and get better on your own, so even if we see fourteen thousand cases a year, fifteen thousand cases a year, we just do like fifteen hundred cases surgeries a year. That's a small amount of that's a small number of patients that we actually do surgery on. We yeah. would first the surgeons are you know your your reputable surgeons will be the first people who will tell you don't have the surgery if you don't think you need the surgery. 
okay. and yeah and we're pushing for a lot for for shared decision making you know so we're looking at we're using big data you know in real time telling patients okay you have this, these characteristics these are your you know your disability scores right now if we do the surgery for you the probability of you getting better is this 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 and again you have we give you time uh for you to think about it mm -hmm. Yeah, um, you know, it's been so interesting just seeing how much the research plays into, you know, better recoveries and and so many things. Do you find, and you may not work, you know, know so much about this side of things, but is it hard to get the funding? Do you think people aren't realizing how much this really takes to do the work that's necessary? Yes, it's really, really hard to get the funding uh, because one, we're not sexier. Than, 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 than let's say cancer or heart disease or breast. right right exactly so we don't have we don't have that you know that amount of drama you know what I'm yeah. saying? uh unless it's a spinal cord injury and it's trauma which isn't really the bulk of the patients we treat then it's really really hard to get get funding that's one one thing the other thing too is that for us it's really really hard to do what we call level one randomized clinical trials that are what we call double blind because once you put an implant in a patient there's no way we can be blinded we can't do you know we can't do sham surgery versus no sham surgery you know versus the versus surgery that so it's kind of hard to find funding because those are the the standards that were held up to. So yeah, it's, it's really, really hard to get funding. Um, NIH funding is hard to get because again, it's it's really hard to design a study that's, I mean, orthopedics wise, because it's just hard. Yeah. Well, that's, you know, that's one reason we wanted to focus on it this much is just because we know how important it is and we know how many people are affected, like more people are affected by this than most other conditions and yet because the stories aren't you know as specific or dramatic like you say it can mm -hmm. be harder to tell the stories about why we need the funding so um so yeah that makes a lot of sense well thank you so much dr carry for joining us today um we appreciate your work and um we just appreciate your time and and your words of wisdom on this no thank you very much for allowing us to share um our approach, how we've tried to, you know, look at things, not just from the surgical side, but, you know, trying to uh, take care of the patient as a whole and trying to get them to recover faster and make better decisions about the, their back health. Yes, absolutely. And we'll see you next time, everyone. Thanks. Thank you.